you're back in business with me, Harsha Subramaniam, Life Eskis and Rachel's BC now joins us on this conversation. Life, many thanks for joining in. We're talking about China and we've seen Chinese manufacturing contract for the first time in seven months. How are you reading this and what's your economic outlook for China? Yeah, that's true. I think we've had somewhat softer numbers in for China over the past few months than expected. Uh, some of that, of course, relates to the somewhat weakened global economic backdrop we've seen over the past few months, which have also been reflected effectively in some of the export numbers we've seen out of some of the other Asian countries. So that external weakness, those external headwinds, have certainly been weighing on growth in China as well. And in addition to that, we've also seen uh, that some of, should we say, on the domestic side, some of the demand has also been softening to some extent uh, as well uh, in China. So that's sort of added to, to the story right now. So I think potentially we're looking at a, at a little bit uh, more, I would say, sort of a slow recovery in China going ahead. There could be a bit of a softer reading in the second quarter for GDP than expected. I think looking forward, though, to the second half of the year, we still believe that the lack effect of some of the monetary easing undertaken last year the introduction of further, should we say, fiscal measures, including the moving forward, some of the infrastructure-related investment projects and other investment projects that are now filtering through to the economy, will begin to gradually lift growth. We also expect in the second half of the year that the global backdrop will be, be better than what we are looking at now. In the U.S., we're expecting a private sector-led recovery in the second half of the year. In Europe, conditions should be somewhat more stable as well. So these factors will help uh, lift growth in China uh, during the second half of 2013 and bring about a uh, recovery in growth. But it's probably going to be a relatively flat recovery in growth uh, as we, we see it. Right, there is a view emerging right now that the Chinese authorities may be okay with slower but more balanced growth. Uh, you know, is that a fundamental shift in policy and how do you think the markets are factoring this in? I think it is to some extent factored in. I think it has been understood for a while that I think what the Chinese now are looking for going ahead is, is, is higher, should we say, quality growth, more sustainable growth, right? So right now, of course, they have on the one hand uh, considerations about, you know, the slowdown that's uh, filtering through. They don't want too much of a slowdown taking place, of course. They still want employment growth. They still want to cater to that effectively. But at the same time, there are still some, should we say, imbalances in the Chinese economy, including related to, should we say, the housing market, that they want to be somewhat cautious about, you know, flaring up, allowing to flare up again. So they have to sort of walk in the short term a little bit of a straight and narrow, provide some support to growth, but not too much. So I think uh, growth at around current levels is not something they're too uncomfortable with. And I think over the medium term, what they're really looking for is, is a rebalancing in growth, more towards consumption-led growth. There will still be a need for, for investment-led growth, but I think the nature of the investment-led growth will change to some degree. Uh, there will still be a need for basic infrastructure-related investments, etc., because the urbanization is still far from over in China. But there will also be a need for investments in more productivity-enhancing machinery as well, so China can basically increase productivity and have productivity be a bigger source of growth going ahead. Sure. Uh, you know, like the, the bigger concern is, what does a slowing China mean for the rest of the world, specifically commodity markets and equity markets? Yeah, I think, I mean, China, of course, has a big global economic footprint. Uh, so there are implications for not just the rest of Asia, for, for, but for the rest of the world if, if China uh, begins to slow down. I think if we, we're talking about, uh, you know, less, uh, I mean, more sideways growth in, in the short term and and a more delayed recovery, I think that's not going to do a lot of damage uh, to growth, uh, to commodity markets for that matter. Of course, if there's a more you know, significant slowdown in growth, which is clearly not what we're expecting, <clears throat> that clearly will have implications for uh, you know, commodity markets that could, could add to sort of further downward pressures on that front. Of course, it would have real economic implications for some of the trading partners here uh, in Asia as well. Europe is also exporting a lot to China, so there will be also be spillovers through the, through the trade channel. And I think also if China, again, that's a hypothetical, was to slow down more, of course, it would have uh, implications for, should we say, market sentiments more generally speaking. So that could, of course, also have implications for both equity and bond markets. Uh, but as I said, what we're looking at really is that you know, maybe growth would be somewhat more sideways uh, in the short term before we see a slow recovery during the second half of the year. I think in that environment, 
maybe we won't see much of a lift to commodity prices in the very short term, but I think as we start to see the recovery in China solidified, maybe closer toward the end of this year, more so into next year as well, uh, commodity prices will begin to find a floor and gradually move up again. Sure, one final question, Leif, and uh, you know, this is with respect to the yuan. The yuan has seen a, a sharp rise, uh, and there have been reports that the PBOC and the government authorities may, be, may just be considering uh, capital account convertibility. Uh, is that a possibility, you would think? Well, I think uh, they are, of course, uh, working with, with a medium-term plan of internationalization of the renminbi. So, so that's, that's very much in the cards. I mean, that's the plan that they have uh, officially announced a, a while ago, and that has continued to move forward on that front. So I think that's something we'll see more and more of, uh, of course, over the next uh, couple of years. And potentially five years down the road, we could have uh, basically a full internationalization of the renminbi. Um, so I think these reforms on that front will continue. Uh, they have to continue a number of fronts, both in terms of, you know, settling more trade in, in the currency. You need to have, of course, further development of domestic uh, financial markets to, to allow the economy to absorb a more open capital account. So pro progress on that front will continue to sort of help facilitate this opening up. Life, we leave it there. Many thanks for joining us with your perspective. Life Eskerson of, from HSBC talking about China and the Chinese economy. Back home, when we're talking about markets back home, a crystal study shows that mid-cap stocks yielded more returns when compared to large-cap stocks and are less volatile. Uh, Sandeep Sabrawal, Senior Director of Capital Markets at Crystal Research, now joins us with more on the study that Crystal has done. Sandeep, thank you for joining us today. Uh, take us through the first of your findings. You're actually saying that, uh, that the mid-caps have outperformed the large-caps. Yes, uh, thank you, and, and glad to be on the show. Uh, yes, we, you know, the common public perception is to actually uh, invest in mega, mega cap stocks because they are perceived to offer higher returns at, at less risk. And so we just wanted to test that hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And for that, you know, we took a representative of the large caps, which is the Nifty Index, and for the mid caps, the CNX mid cap index. And we found a very interesting uh, phenomenon. We found that over the last 10 years, uh, you know, uh, mid cap stocks, actually the mid cap index, has given 23% uh, you know, annualized return, mm. while the Nifty index has just given 19%. Mm. Uh, what was further surprising actually was that uh, you know, the mid-caps actually had a lower volatility, and, mm. and you know, if you consider uh, volatility as a measure of risk, mm. then sort of lower risk than large caps. So, that was, uh, so you know, we decided to test this further and said maybe this is happening in 10 years. Mm. What about other time frames? And we found that, you know, over a five-year period as well, uh, we got the same results, uh, you know, higher returns mm. and lower risk in mid-caps. And even from inception date of early 2001, 2003, we found, again, the, you know, the same results. Sure. Just, just to sort of dig in a little deeper uh, on the aspect of volatility, uh, Sandeep, you know, at the end of the day, you're comparing indices. Uh, and some of these constitutional indices changes very periodically, just for the benefit of viewers. Uh, what was the constitution of the mid-cap index and how different has it been uh, with the large-cap index over a period of time? Uh, have, have these, has this change in volatility been lesser because of the composition uh, of these industries and the business cyclicality? That's a very good question, actually. So, yes, you know, uh, it has got a lot to do with the constitution, constitution of the index as well. You know, the Nifty Index is the first 50 stocks uh, by market cap uh, on free float. And uh, the CNX uh, mid-cap index is the next 100 stocks. So, uh, you know, the overall portfolio in, uh, you know, in the mid-cap index is uh, diverse. More importantly, if you look at the constitution of the industries in this index, uh, you know, you have a lot of high-growth industries, um, including pharmaceuticals, consumer, and banks in, uh, in the mid-cap index. While the large cap, uh, you know, has been, um, is uh, the top five industries over there are uh, banks, obviously, but then you've got software, which has not done so well in the last few years. And then, uh, you know, you have a lot of oil and gas and industrial stocks. So, so yes, uh, you know, the, the sectors that constitute the industries also play a very big factor. Have you drawn a similar inference as far as mutual funds are concerned, those that invest in mid-cap funds as opposed to the large cap or the balanced funds? Yes, uh, we found a very high correlation with that. Uh, so we tracked, uh, you know, uh, mutual funds 
which track the Nifty index, and we track the uh, mutual funds, which uh, track the mid-cap index. And we found that the ones that cap uh, that track the mid-cap index actually outperformed the ones that track the Nifty index. Now, over here, um, you know, I just want to give a caveat. It's not that every uh, mid-cap index outperformed, uh, you know, the large-cap index. Uh, but on a weighted average basis, you know, mid-cap indices, uh, uh, mid-cap funds actually outperformed large-cap funds. Uh, but there were, again, there was divergence in the individual performance as well. So, you know, the difference between the top performing and, and um, bo bottom performing uh, funds was high, even in the mid cap. One final question, Sandeep, for an investor who's looking at uh, uh, investing in the long term, uh, how does one read this this inference or the insights that you've made in this report? Right. Uh, no, so I think uh, the, the sort of key takeaway over here is uh, that, you know, it's always good to test public perceptions. You know, the public perception still holds that if I, uh, you know, in the, if I invest in the top 10, 20, 50 stocks, I'll always be safe and get high returns. So, you know, one has to look at a broad diversified portfolio, which constitutes both the large caps and the mid caps. You know, ultimately, it's really very well diverse portfolios that perform well over a long period of time. Sandeep Sabaral, we leave it there. Many thanks for joining us with your perspective. Uh, good talking to you. Sandeep Sabaral from Crystal on the report comparing large cap and mid cap indices over the past 10 years. Out of time on the show. Thank you so much for joining us in business today.